Speaking of Alternatives with Keshav Rajagopalan, Managing Director, Head of Product and Strategy at PGIM Multi Asset Solutions. Data centers are one of the fastest growing areas within real estate investing, driven by the increasing digitization of our lives and the evolution of AI. Keshav explores the fast-moving world of data center investing with Jim Futh, Managing Director of Global Data Center Investments at PGM Real Estate. It is hard to think of a sector that is more dynamic today than the data center space. For several years now, it looks like nothing could put a lid on the world's ever-increasing need for cloud computing capability. And this demand is only accelerated with the explosion of AI and all of its real-world applications, some of which we're seeing today, and some undoubtedly that are going to reveal themselves in the coming years. Nearly all of this computing capacity is to travel through data centers, and there are clearly not enough of them in place. So the race to build more data centers, as well as the energy infrastructure to power them, is most definitely on. But before we dive deeper into this fascinating investment space, let's find out a little bit more about you, Jim. Talk to me about how you came to the data center space and asset management. What interested you about it? Sure. Thanks for the invitation. I'm 30 plus years in real estate and finance. I've always really enjoyed working on large and complex real estate projects and in different global markets, which is probably why I was drawn to data centers. I do have a bit of a passion for the complex engineering aspects of data centers, including electrical engineering, mechanical, structural engineering. I really enjoy those tactile elements of real estate, and ultimately, I just like to understand how things work. I've been fortunate to lead real estate and data centers for companies, including AT&T and most recently Amazon Web Services, where I was for eight years before deciding to start a new chapter at PGM as a fully dedicated portfolio manager. Well, that's really interesting. And you found a space that's much more than just bricks and mortar. The more I learn about spaces like data centers, the more I realize that the engineering like curiosity is essential in this space. If you had one minute to convince me there's an opportunity here, what would you say? Well, in simplest terms, it would have to be the supply and demand imbalance within the data center sector. The demand for data centers, which is driven by the increasing digitization of all of our lives, is outpacing the ability of the development community to build data centers to support that demand. And when you think about how much of our lives rely on everything digital and how AI is now evolving, this supply and demand imbalance isn't going away anytime soon, which is presenting an investment opportunity for sophisticated investors who can see the return potential. That's good. I'm convinced. But I'm sure there's a lot more to talk about. So let's keep moving. We like to unpack a recent headline, and it's timely, as you just mentioned, the evolution of AI. It is really on top of everyone's mind, and data centers are at the heart of making some of this AI hype become reality. So here's a headline to explore in that vein from Infrastructure Investor. It says, power struggles emerge as AI fuels data center growth. When you hear that, what do you think? The growth of AI is just amplifying an already booming demand for compute capacity. When I was with AWS, we were building data centers as fast as we could in many global markets, and we still couldn't keep up with the demand from the Amazon customer base alone. And that was before 18 to 24 months ago when ChatGPT became publicly available. Now, given that AI is intrinsically tied to the cloud, computing hyperscalers, including Amazon, Microsoft, are best positioned to benefit from the AI boom. And the hyperscalers are in the space in which institutional investors typically play. But data centers are complex, expensive, and power hungry. And there's a finite amount of industrially zoned land in which you can build them. The only option is to build further and further away. AI is essentially going to push construction of data centers into more remote areas, but there's still demand for data centers in those close-in city locations. There's a balance to be struck. While AI and hyperscalers are grabbing our attention, and rightfully so, the data center space is quite varied, supporting a wide-ranging mix of users and diverse demands. The nature of their use affects where data centers are built, among other factors. There's a push to build in more remote areas, but there's still demand for the close city locations. Can you give the audience a bit of an idea of the different types of applications that are adapted to both cases, or does it really not matter? Just need to get a data center up as quickly as possible, given the supply-demand imbalance you're talking about? 
No, it does matter. The workloads absolutely matter. And I can give a couple of use cases. If you are a Wall Street trader and doing that digitally, milliseconds absolutely matter. But if you are scrolling on Facebook, for example, and it takes a second or two for your feed to load, it's not that big an issue. So for different applications and different workloads, the latency absolutely matters. For those data centers, broadly speaking, when they're interacting with the public, they need to be in close proximity to the public. For AI applications, and particularly for the training phase of AI, in that phase of AI, it's not interacting with the public. So those data centers that are actually doing the machine learning can be in more remote locations. Great. Really helpful insight, Jim. So now digging into the details a bit more, where would you say are the real areas of focus for you? And equally, where are the challenges in the space, the tailwinds and headwinds, so to speak? And how do you think about working through these? Sure. So from a tailwind standpoint, there is a logical progression when we have this supply and demand imbalance. When we have low vacancies, rental rates will typically rise in the sector. In markets where there's a severe shortage of supply, typically based on the lack of available power, those rental rates rise even more. So if you're able to develop these projects in the right location and deliver them in a fairly near-term time frame, 24 to 36 months, there's a huge appetite for this uh, data center capacity, and that's a big tailwind. Meanwhile, the hyperscale tenants, that is, the leases tend to be long. They're 12 to 15 years in length. Typically, they have fixed annual rental increases, and the credit of those hyperscale tenants like Microsoft, AWS, Google, Oracle, etc., are typically investment grade, which makes for an attractive, long-term, stabilized investment. Now, from a headwind standpoint, everybody is on a learning curve when it comes to data centers versus other sectors of real estate. So as a newer asset class, the different risk considerations, understanding cost implications, even simple things about how rent is quoted in terms of price per kilowatt versus a price per square foot or square meter, for example, everybody is still learning about those aspects of how to think about data centers. A typical data center entry price is about $400 million, so it's not for the faint of heart, whereas a typical residential or an office building might be in the 20 to $60 million range. So they're expensive, they're large, they're complex investments for sophisticated investors that want to come on this journey as demand for data centers continues to evolve. I would say the biggest limitation on the supply side is developing data centers in the right locations. The power utilities, which feed the power for these data centers, were not designed for the type of loads, the demands that are coming from this sector. And so the timelines are becoming longer and longer as the areas around large population centers get that power. This obviously limits the growth potential, and it means investors need to be cognizant of who can circumnavigate those challenges and develop data centers in a reasonable time frame. And like everyone, we need to be mindful of interest rates because it impacts all aspects of building data centers and in turning around a stabilized asset. And a lot of what you said brings other questions to mind. So one is you're talking a lot about very large internationally recognized tenants that have these needs and a term that 10, 15, 20 years ago really didn't contemplate hyperscale data centers. Can you give the audience an idea of what else is out there? 20 years ago, we talked about co-location, and that was probably adapted to a very different moment in the development of the internet and where the digital world was at. And therefore, the kinds of needs we had in data centers was really early on. Besides the hyperscales today, what else is out there? And what are the pluses and minuses of some of these other types of data centers versus the hyperscale? Sure. The hyperscale really refers to those tenants that I mentioned, Microsoft, AWS, Google, Oracle, et cetera. And they are the largest consumers of data center capacity. And that tenant segment is growing at over a 23% compound annual growth rate. There are two other recognized data center tenant segments. One is retail and the other is enterprise wholesale. Now, retail is a different business model where a data center is built by a co-location company and they lease it out to many small tenants. You might have 20 or 30 tenants in a single building that have much smaller power requirements and physical space requirements. A retail data center is like owning a hotel. You have smaller tenants, shorter term leases, and you have other income from other sources like a restaurant or a spa or conference facilities. 
The other tenant segment is enterprise wholesale, which is building a data center and leasing it out to an enterprise or a corporate customer like General Electric or a Ford Motor Company. The retail and the enterprise wholesale segments are growing between 3 to 6% compound annual growth rate, whereas the hyperscale is really driving the demand at over a 23% CAGR. That's interesting, and it gives a lot of clarity on what's out there, even if the hyperscale seems to be the hot topic today for a lot of investors. So another question that comes to mind, obviously the supply-demand imbalance you've mentioned several times, and it's one of the attractions of the space. A lot of the supply challenges are around energy needs. Are there other topics? These are highly sophisticated products. I'm sure they're linked to supply chains that have had bottlenecks. The workforce comes to mind. It probably needs a more skilled kind of a workforce to put the sophisticated equipment together. What other areas are making the supply side complex in this overall data center ecosystem? Sure. We've talked about power, which is probably your biggest limitation. Your second largest limitation is the availability of industrially zoned land in these tier one markets around the world. There's a finite amount of industrially zoned land, and it's in competition from both data center operators and industrial logistics type of operators. So the price for that land in most of these markets is going up dramatically. You talked about supply chain. There's a finite number of construction companies with experience to build data centers, and they're in high demand. In different markets, it can be 24 to 36 months to actually lock down a general contractor to build a data center or longer. And then, of course, there's all the mechanical and electrical equipment you need to procure, including backup generators that you need to install. And if there's a long lead time on some of those elements, that can add delay as well. The demand for power is inextricably linked to data center growth. Finding and securing reliable and affordable power is at the heart of the supply-demand tension that dominates data center real estate investing today. Another item that really strikes me in data centers is how it cuts across multiple areas of needed investment. It's a huge capital need, and it's probably hard for you as an investor to be able to focus solely on the data center itself. The need for power as you build these data centers is an example that's so overwhelming compared to other asset classes. At PGM, we've also been investing in data center adjacent industries, cooling centers and power facilities as examples, and we've been ramping this up. To do this, you have to understand power. Knowledge of power and where it comes from must matter, and it must matter a lot depending on where you're trying to build. We know in Europe, for example, there's a real top-down push from the government to make power investing as sustainable as possible. How do you think about that? How do you inform yourself? What are the kind of skill sets you need to be knowledgeable about given how expansive all of this is? Even if you're not ultimately the finer builder of that power, how do you integrate that into the overall investment decision for the data center that allows you to get projects completed depending on what part of the world you're in? Sure. Well, I think it's a great segue to kind of sustainability, right? The power is fundamental to data centers, but that power needs to be sustainable in all of the markets so that it doesn't materially impact the residential, the other users that are non-data center users in any given market. Now, from a sustainability standpoint, data centers fundamentally need to be on 24-7, 365. It needs to be up 99.999% of the time. Now, in order to do that, the power needs to come from those utilities who get their power from a number of different generation sources, some of which are renewable, some are not. Now, the industry is very focused on building renewable projects to support the demand. Amazon, for example, is spending huge amounts of capital to build renewable projects, and they've been one of the largest, if not the largest, supporter of renewable projects in the world. The industry is very focused on creating and evolving designs to make data centers more efficient so that there is less wasted power. And they're put in locations where you can use, for instance, outside air to cool the data centers as much as possible rather than using electrical capacity to cool it versus a refrigerant type of cooling solution. So the industry is very focused on making the data center sector as efficient as it can be, both from a renewable standpoint and from a utilization standpoint as well. Thanks for that, Jim. We always like to end by going to the PGM distribution teams who have their ears to the ground with clients and ask them to gather questions from the floor. So let's go through a few of these. The first one, you've talked about the power demand and logistical challenges of location availability. So what are the key markets of opportunity for you, whether that's the US, EMEA, or APAC, or any in the developing world that might be interesting? It's a global strategy. What do you think about when you think about the different regions? 
Within the data center industry, there are recognized tier one cities and tier two cities. In North America, the tier one cities are Northern Virginia, which happens to be the largest data center market in the world. And then going east to west, you have Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, Phoenix, and of course, the Silicon Valley. Those are recognized as the tier one markets in the U.S. Now, there are definitely data centers being built outside of those tier one markets, and we can talk about that as well. In Asia Pacific, it's Tokyo, Osaka, Seoul, Singapore, Sydney, your tier one markets. Now, tier two markets, you could be Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, etc. In EMEA, there's an acronym FLAP-D, which stands for Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, and Dublin. Those are the recognized tier one markets in EMEA. The tier two markets might be Milan, Madrid, Geneva, Warsaw, and perhaps some in the Nordic countries, maybe Stockholm. The tier one markets are really where the fundamental demand is, and it's kind of where all of the hyperscale tenants planted their flag in the early days and where they continue to have customer demand. Now, you can't continue to build only in those markets, which is why you're seeing new markets emerge in Germany, for example. Berlin is emerging as a data center market as Frankfurt is getting constrained from a power and a land standpoint, and it's just not able to keep up with the demand. Interesting. Truly is global, and I'm sure more and more markets will come out as we start saturating some of the markets you've mentioned, and the capacity will still not be met. So second question from the floor. Do hyperscalers build themselves? You've already touched upon this a bit based on your experiences at Amazon. Clearly, they do build themselves to some extent, but maybe to change the question a bit, why not all of them? Why do they need to work with operators like PGM Real Estate? So... The hyperscalers, in many cases, they do build for themselves. AWS and Microsoft have the largest self-build capabilities, and the other hyperscalers have a different degree of self-build capability, that they can't keep up with their customer demand by only building through their own internal self-build capability. They absolutely rely on the development community to build data centers in all of the locations around the world where they have customer demand, but they're not able to build themselves. So there's absolutely a symbiotic relationship between the hyperscale customers and the development community. And again, it's just in order for those hyperscalers to meet the demand from their customers. Artificial intelligence is having a transformational impact on much of the world economy, including on data center demand. It's easier to look back at the enormous changes that have taken place than to predict with accuracy how much more it will grow in the coming years. But sound investors are looking to the future. Third and final question. We've talked about the evolution of AI and the digital revolution. Where do you think we are in that trajectory? If this is a marathon, which mile are we in? Or if you prefer the metric system, which kilometer are we in? I would say that we're still in the first quarter of the race. What's transformed with the digitization of all of our lives is increasing every day. And AI is really just the latest iteration of the digital demand in all of our lives. And there will be another AI type of impact at some point in the future, which will, again, serve more demand for the data center industry. Andy Jassy, who is now the CEO of Amazon, used to be the CEO of Amazon Web Services. And he was quoted earlier this year saying, we're a $100 billion plus annualized revenue run rate company. And yet 85% or more of the global IT spend remains on premises. And what he means by on premise is with enterprise users, companies like the Ford Motor Company and General Electric building their own data centers. So if 85% of the spend is with those enterprise Christ customers, then only 15% is with the hyperscale customers, which tells us that there is a huge amount of future demand. And that 85% did not even include the AI demand. So over the next 10 to 20 years, a huge opportunity in front of the hyperscale sector. Jim, thanks so much for being part of this podcast. You've walked us through an interesting asset class that is so much more than just bricks and mortar. I'm sure our listeners have found it as interesting as I have. Thanks much. You're very welcome. I'll finish up with my three main takeaways from this conversation. Number one is that it is difficult to get around the sheer magnitude and absolute scale of the investment needed in data centers to meet this expected computing power and the needs that just keep growing with AI. But not just in AI. You've got 5G broadband, you've got the Internet of Things, 
and you've got many other areas needing an increase in the ability to access available data. Number two, in the face of this unprecedented demand, supply will continue to be a challenge, whether that's due to lack of power capacity and infrastructure, lack of primary materials and components needed for the sophisticated equipment to go into the data centers, or the lack of skilled labor. Or frankly, general nimbyism from communities that won't want a data center near them. And of course, perhaps the most important topic on the supply side is the global push towards sustainable energy, which requires a massive step change in investment. And number three, this inextricable link between data centers and the absolute cutting edge of technology and innovation means that as long-term investors in the space, we'll need to continually adapt to the latest needs and evolving opportunities and challenges in front of us. So that's really it for this episode. Join us next time when our guest is Mario Spanishek, Managing Director and Head of Local Currency and FX at Pigeon Fixed Income. He will be here to talk about all things emerging market debt on Speaking of Alternatives. Speaking of Alternatives with Keshav Rajagopalan, a podcast from Pigeon. Follow, subscribe, and if you like what you hear, go ahead and give us a review. And be sure to look for the podcast, The Outthinking Investor, also from PGIM. This podcast is intended solely for professional investor use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments involve risk, including the loss of capital. PGIM is not acting as your fiduciary. The contents are for informational purposes only, are based on information available when created and are subject to change. It is not intended as investment, legal or tax advice and does not consider our recipients' financial objectives. This podcast includes the views and opinions of the authors and may not reflect PGIM's views. PGIM and its related entities may make investment decisions that are inconsistent with the views expressed herein. This podcast should not be reproduced without PGIM's prior written consent. No liability is accepted for any direct, indirect or consequential loss that may arise from any use of the information contained in or derived from this podcast. This material is not for distribution to any recipient located in any jurisdiction where such distribution is unlawful. PGM is the global asset management business of Prudential Financial Incorporated, which is not affiliated in any manner with Prudential PLC, Incorporated in the United Kingdom or with Prudential Assurance Company, a subsidiary of M&G PLC, incorporated in the United Kingdom. Copyright 2024. The PGIM logo and the rock symbols are service marks of PGIM's parent and its related entities, registered in many jurisdictions worldwide.